good afternoon gentlemen and friend ladies it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you all for this distinguished lecture series uh, on energy efficiency which we are holding on uh, monday first monday of every month for last three months uh, as you know cii green business center has been involved in several activities to disseminate information uh, to, and uh, to bring in some distinguished uh, speakers and experts to speak to all of us the objective one is to make uh, complex concepts understandable to all of us as well as bring in newer ideas for us for us to take up today we have the privilege of uh, shri nk ranganath uh, ambassador and uh, former managing director of grand force from india to address us as a distinguished as part of the distinguished lecture series on energy efficiency Mr. Ranganath and uh, Grand Force has been almost synonymous with pumps in India. Um, Mr. Ranganath has been an, an excellent engineer, a power plant expert, a project expert, expert in boilers and heat recovery. Been the founder of uh, Grand Force in India since 1998, 1998, and uh, has contributed extraordinarily to pump energy efficiency improvement in in, in India. Apart from being an excellent engineer. Uh, Mr. Ranganath has been an excellent communicator. Anything and everything on energy efficiency, Mr. Ranganath uh, uh, has got very clear views and ideas and also contributes a lot in communicating and reaching out these concepts to the larger uh, community in India. He's very passionate about energy efficiency. He's also very passionate about India-centric innovation uh, and uh, he's always ready to give a helping hand whenever we go and seek him for uh, any time to speak to us, assist us, guide us on energy efficiency in industry or buildings or pumps. Mr. Ranganath has contributed tremendously to the uh, energy efficiency movement, green building movement, and also to the water efficiency activities of CII for quite some time. Apart from being the managing director of uh, Grand Force and contributing to pump energy efficiency in, in India, Mr. Ranganath is also on the boards of uh, several other companies, including uh, the, an NGO called Banyan. So we have an uh, excellent engineer and an extraordinary communicator. Without much further ado, I leave the stage to Mr. N.K. Ranganath to take over. Mr. Ranganath, sir. Thank you, Giri. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let me first thank uh, Giri and CI GDC for inviting me to this third lecture on energy efficiency. Uh, we've had Ravi and Umi preceding me, and uh, they gave you a nice perspective on the subject, both at the macro level and at the user level too. So I will also try and give an overview, trying not to repeat what they said. I'll also delve into the specific area of pumping system in which sector I have been working for decades. All of you know we are living through tough times. We are already facing, we were already facing a world. Pardon me? Yeah, we were already facing low growth in the economy and we were being negatively impacted by the effects of climate change when we were hit by the COVID-19 virus, which almost has brought the world to a standstill. It will perhaps take a couple of years for us to claw back to the economic position we were before COVID-19 hit us. For all the negative impact it has had on the economy, COVID seems to have had a positive impact on the environment. We had not breathed such clean air in our cities, nor had we seen such clean waters in our rivers. We even had animals and birds from the wild visiting the city, perhaps to see the humans locked up in their homes in a neat reversal of roads. We were the zoo animals. This is perhaps an opportunity for us to learn and change our behavior. We need to learn to live with less and be mind, more mindful of uh, sustainable practices. Energy efficiency, as all of you know, impacts the climate. It has a direct impact on CO2 emissions. Uh, better efficiency improves the economy and saves money for all. When I see what's going to happen in the next two or three years in the corporate world, there may not be many ground, brown or greenfield uh, projects that are going to come up. Uh, and most businesses will focus on bringing down their fixed and variable costs per unit of output to help them remain competitive. Energy is a major contributor to the input cost of any product or service. And the more efficient we are, the more we will save. 
let's look at india's position now india is a rapidly growing economy which needs energy to meet its meet its growth objectives and we need to do this in a sustainable manner when we look at energy security we need to have a very holistic approach to what we need to do um, a holistic approach in the sense that we just don't look at electrical power but we also look at fuel for transportation for process heating cooling fuel for households for cooking heating etc uh, all the energy that we require to to run our daily lives is something that we need to look at all the time i'm just trying to put my phone on silent okay uh, having said that we look at sources of fuel and energy that must be accounted for we start with coal oil and gas hydro nuclear wind and solar geothermal biomass waste heat and finally energy efficiency which is also called a source of energy i don't know um, most of you must have heard of the word megawatt negative watts the more we save the better it is and uh, mind you if you keep the life cycle costs in our minds it is less expensive to save a unit of power than to generate it especially if we consider the embodied energy to extract the fuel the intrinsic energy that is there in the fuel versus the electrical or mechanical energy it generates uh, we will see that it is far more uh, cheaper to save one watt of energy than to produce one watt of energy as you know conversion from one form to another always leads to losses so increasing energy requirements in india coupled with a slower than expected increase in domestic fuel production means india has to import a lot of its energy requirements and with the nation growing very rapidly demand for energy will increase as of today if not among the top 3 india is at least among the top 5 greenhouse gas emitters globally and this is something that we need to keep in mind but having said that out of the 1.3 billion people that we have around 30% do not have access to electricity in their homes they may have electricity in their village but not in their homes and about 40% still use firewood for cooking of course this is coming down due to the government's ridiculous scheme and perhaps will continue to go down but yet there are a considerable number of people who are using firewood which is perhaps one of the most inefficient ways of uh, using fuel if you look at 1920 india's net imports uh, were nearly 227 million tons of crude oil and its products and about 200 million tons of coal which to me is perhaps close to 50% of the total primary energy consumption of the country we are still dependent on almost 50% on imports though india's proven coal reserves happens to be the fifth largest in the world government is doing something about the privatizing coal and trying to increase the production of here if you look at oil consumption india is ranked third after usa and china let's look at renewables we have we have a focus on we still produce only about 10% of our electricity in india through renewables and still 75% is coming through thermal and the rest of course is through large hydro and a small 3.5% through nuclear the focus in the past has been on supply side and with the poor efficiencies and low plant load factors coupled with the huge transmission and distribution losses there's always been a deficit especially during peak load times of course this has changed in the recent past uh but uh, perhaps from a 12% deficit we are now down to a little less than 1% deficit which itself is a great job done over the last few years the focus on demand side management began perhaps uh, over the last 5 to 7 years after the establishment of uh, be in 2002 and the introduction of the energy ratings and the and the pact scheme uh, according to a power ministry report uh, the, the initiatives taken by the be on energy efficiency has led to a savings worth around 89122 crores in just 2018-19 which is considerable and these efforts have also contributed in reducing about 152 million tons of co2 we have uh, pledged in paris that by 2030 40% of our installed capacity will come from renewables efforts have been made but though these efforts have been made to harness renewable energy it has slowed down a bit over the last year or so and we need to refocus on establishing sustainable models the slowdown has been 
um, a kind of competition where prices were driven down to unsustainable levels, we need to find a way of ensuring that it makes business sense. As I already said, the deficit is now less than 1%. In, in 2019-20, it was 0.5%. In terms of million units and uh, around 0.7 percent within PTOs. To be really energy efficient, we need to harness all forms of energy, especially that which is wasted, and improve overall system efficiencies. We cannot. We have to look at it holistically. We, need, we cannot look at it in a siloed fashion. And this needs a system approach. The approach should be both on the demand side and supply side. Energy efficiency norms have to be specified for all energy consuming equipment, much as we are doing in the automobile sector. Motors, which are perhaps universally the highest consumers of power, need to have standards that are high, that are global. Uh, our minimum standard in India, I think, is now IE2. I'm not sure if it's been made a standard, but uh, a minimum standard has to be IE3, and uh, this should be made uh, universal across all equipment used in India. China has done that recently. Energy efficiency norms should be for pumps, fans, air conditioners, refrigerators, and all white goods that we use. And I'm glad that uh, CII GBC has come up with some green products, and I do hope they will extend this to all those products that we use in our day-to-day -day life. Parallelly, we also need to improve the generation efficiencies of our power stations and reduce the TND losses or what they call at &C losses, which today are at an average upwards of 25%. This needs a shift from tendering based on the lowest first cost to one based on the lowest life cycle cost. Life cycle costs will account for efficiency, repair and maintenance, and disposal costs too. You actually think from cradle to grave and rebirth. This is very important if you need to change the way we are looking at things in terms of uh, conservation and efficiency and its impact on the climate. In other areas too, there are many examples of energy recovery. In our day-to-day -day areas, in cars that we use today, we have regenerative braking. We have an engine cut off while waiting for signals. <clears throat> in processes using steam, we, start, we had cogeneration for many years, condensate recovery for many years, waste heat recovery. And now we have been able to even uh, uh, start recovering low-grade heat. We also have micro turbines that can be used instead of pressure reducing valves to recover the energy lost when we bring down pressure of steam. Because once you bring down cut pressure, that means you're, you're sort of put in energy and you're killing energy without any useful work done. Today, like I said, we are able to recover low grade uh, heat from furnaces, heaters, air conditioners too. Similarly, condensate whether hot from steam or cold from air conditions, air conditioners can be recovered and the heat extracted in the water we use. Actually, in our uh, office and factory, all the condensate from air conditioners, the water is collected and reused, and uh, it's not let out. Air conditioning systems that are perhaps the highest energy consuming equipment, and uh, these in any building perhaps account for a major portion of the energy consumption. But these are becoming more and more efficient uh, with the advent of variable secondary uh, systems, variable primary systems, variable peak chillers and now variable speed tertiary pumps replacing valves at the AHU combined with uh, IOT. Uh, and uh, these have given rise to optimizers, which then control the entire system, a, very, a total system approach, bring down energy, energy consumption to as much as even 0.4 to 0.45 IKW per ton of air condition, which is phenomenal. The advent of green buildings and habitats, as well as the green products which CI, GBC, and the IGBC has promoted in India, has had a significant impact on the energy and water consumption in India. Coming from the pump industry, let me give a brief idea of what can be done to reduce energy consumption when using pumps, which almost consume 10% of the world's energy generated today. But one should understand when we talk about technology. It is not a replacement for a poor mindset when it comes to conservation. It is only an enabler for us to help they take the right decisions. So the solutions that I talk about are enablers and not solutions for a poor mindset. Let me see if I can sort of uh, put these few slides that I have. Uh, I might need some help, Venkat. Let me see if I can not find here. Yeah, I think I can get there. Uh, are you able to see?
Are you able to see this, Venkat? Hello? I just need a confirmation. Uh, your uh, yes, sir. presentation is visible, that. but it is in presentation mode, sir. If you could please make on, it to hide the presenter's mode. Yeah. Oh, it's, a, it's in presentation mode, is it? One second. Let me see what I need to do. Yes, sir. We are able to see the second screen as well. Yeah. So you're okay? Will this or I have to change the way it looks? Uh, no, sir. You have to right click and change the hide presenter's view, sir. Right click. Nothing. Uh, okay. Hide presenter's view. Okay. Are you okay now? Um, just a second, sir. Ah, now it's fine, sir. Now it's, now it's fine, sir. Fine. Perfect. So I was telling you that pumps actually consume about 10% of the world's electricity even today. And these are very vital. Pumps are very vital to one's life. These are just like the heart that we have in our bodies, which is the world's best known pump and made by God, pumps are required for every conceivable uh, uh, need if you need to live or if you need to run our businesses, whether it's floods, droughts, etc. you need pumps. Today, as we see, 663 million people are without clean water and about 2.4 billion people are without sanitation. Now, pumps provide and remove water and this is essential. So if you look at what we need to do now, uh, I already told you 10% of the global electricity is consumed by pumps. And most of these pumps, even if not required, run at full speed. One must understand if, if you run at full speed, whether you are consuming water or not, you are consuming power. And that is very, very inefficient way of running a pump. So one needs to see how we can sort of ensure that we run pumps efficiently. But before we go into any kind of technology, we did a, a kind of a audits on pumps, almost 22,000 pumps since 2006, and collected all the data. And we found that the saving, savings potential, if you see the graph, for process water pumps is about 29%, for air conditioning 31, for cooling tower pumps about 35, and water treatment pumps about 35, and boiler feed pumps about 36%. This is what we have found uh, universally. It, uh, on an average of 35% of the power that we are consuming today can be saved very easily, which gave, gave this little uh, note that I put on the side. We felt that energy is expensive, efficiency is not. The potential for saving is pretty high. There are many reasons for inefficiencies, and I'll come first to a mindset. First of all, improper selection. You know, technology is not a solution, like I said before. Improper selection is something that one needs to look at. Lack of pumping system knowledge, or simply a copy paste kind of situation where I did this before, I need to do this now. That doesn't work. The other thing that we have is procurement based on price. Let's cut corners on this, corners on that. Let's reduce the price. Doesn't matter if the efficiency is a little low. Let's buy pumps that are cheap to run, to buy, not to run, because nobody sees the running costs. The other thing that we have seen is design. You know, when you start adding losses or, or what you call safety factors to the losses that we estimate, everybody in every step starts adding losses. If we see that little cart there, that cart is loaded with all the things that we have actually loaded in terms of the actual losses. And finally, that horse or the donkey cannot sort of really pull this. You need an elephant. So where you require perhaps a horse or a donkey, you put an elephant of a pump because you have not sized it properly. The other thing is unnecessary planning for the future. So you plan for the future, that is good. But any building or any factory does not go into full production on day one. So people buy pumps which are sized for full production, just one pump or two pumps, one working, one standby. And then you start running them before it, it, the factory or the building gets occupied, which may take a year or two or three, you will be running pumps so inefficiently that you will lose a lot of money. Better way of doing is to have multiple pumps which come in, switch in and switch out, or perhaps leave a place for adding pumps in the future 
so that you can add them as an event to the cloud. The other one that is also a uh, 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 kind of uh, situation in India is this uh, next word, chalta hai to chalne do. You see that pump there on, 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 the, on the right. Uh, it's an old pump, it's, I don't know, 25 years old, 30 years old, but nobody wants to change it because it has not failed. We don't measure or monitor what is the requirement now. So we have inefficient pumps and some of them run at 25% efficiency. The classic case is, was, was, in a, was in a very large steel mill when we went and replaced a 25 kilowatt pump with a two kilowatt pump and it worked very well. So when one needs to look at your basic engineering practices before you get into technology. The other reasons for inefficiency, sizing of pipes. You know, very often when you look at design, the piping design is done by somebody, the pumps are chosen by somebody, somebody else gives you other data. And generally, bigger pipes are more expensive, so you start cutting down the size of pipes. But the moment you undersize pipes, you create excessive friction loss. And for the rest of the life of that building or that factory or that process, you'll be consuming more electricity. And normally through the life cycle, you see that you have paid four or five times more uh, for the pump that you have bought cheap or for the size of the pipe that you have bought cheap. Design for optimum suction discharge velocities. Higher velocities means higher losses. Make sure that you have the right velocities. Then valves, where you can avoid a valve, please avoid a valve, or if you have to have a valve, please ensure that the valves are sized right and there are no high pressure drops. Avoid unnecessary reduces and bends. Simple, these are simple common sense engineering practice, which is common no longer. We have got into an era of looking at a screen and asking software to tell us what to do. We have lost that little bit of that sense, which says, ah, this is good engineering practice. This is what it should be, because everything comes out of basic physics, chemistry, and biology. And if we tend to forget that, sometimes we lose the good things thinking that uh, uh, all the answers will be given on the screen. It is not unfortunate. Undersizing electrical cables, great savings by undersizing electrical cables. But again, like I said, like pipes, for the rest of your life, because of increased resistance, your power consumption is going to be much, much higher. So if you look at a life cycle of a pump, 10% it's is, is its initial investment, 5% is the maintenance cost through its life, you take a life of 15 years, and 85% is the power cost. So when you look at your next pump or when you're choosing it, please choose wisely and look at all the areas and don't look at pump only as in its own, look at your entire system, your piping, your equipment, your valves, the way you've taken your piping around, what kind of pressure drops, look at the entire system. Closing. Earlier, how do you, okay, you can be very efficient, you can choose the most efficient pumps. How do you maintain energy efficiency over the life cycle? Basically, it requires innovation, design, and efficient equipment to ensure that we have reduced energy consumption through the life cycle of the pump. Now, if you look at pumps, earlier we had pumps which are at a fixed speed. Then we started getting pumps with variable speeds with a drive added on. Now you have pumps with the drive on the motor itself with all the sensors built in. The next step that you see in the box there you have a complete IoT system with sensors all over and what we call adaptive technology where the pump learns how you use it and what it needs to do to ensure that it is running at its most efficient point throughout its process, throughout its life cycle. And if there are any issues, it will even give you a signal as to what is going wrong. So it's very vital to have a system approach to deliver higher efficiency and use IoT, use your startup systems use uh, all that you have today in terms of electronics and sensors to make sure that you have a system which is tuned to run at the highest efficiency and save you the largest quantum of power. All of you are, are smart people, you're good engineers. All you, that need, all you need to do is to work out what is your payback period. And generally, mind you, generally we have seen at least 40% of the systems paying back in less than a year 60% of the systems paying back less than two years, and almost 80% of the systems paying back less than three years. It's only those few with very super sophisticated kind of things which have a payback, you know, say maybe four to five years. So it's very important that you look at this when you look at these systems. 
So by optimizing total systems and not individual products, you have you ensure that you are having efficiency right through the life cycle of your system. Okay. The new thing that has come to the world is IE5 motors. They were introduced about three years ago in uh, Europe. And a couple of years back, uh, we introduced them in India. Uh, although they are expensive, they are the world's most efficient motors. They have embedded electronics, they have embedded drives. It offers over 10% energy savings and perhaps 25% reduction in playback time compared to even IT motors. I've given you two examples in these. One is a 5.5 kilo motor, a kilowatt motor on the left, and the other one is 11 kilowatt motor. So if you see an IE1, which is perhaps the standard in India, if it's at 84.7% uh, efficiency at full load, mind you, these are full load efficiencies, and the efficiencies drop considerably at part loads where most of the pumps or blowers work. But compare that to an IE5 motor, which is 92.6, and an IE3, which is at 89.2 for a 5.5 kilowatt motor. And an 11 kilowatt motor, you see similar, very similar, there's almost uh, a 7% difference between IE1 and almost a 5% difference between IE, uh, IE3 and uh, 3 to 5% difference between IE3 and IE5 motor. So if at all you have uh, processes that are running 24 by 7, I would advise you look at the motors, not necessarily on pumps, on blowers, on conveyors, on whatever you have. And if there's a variable load and it runs 24 by 7, you probably will save a lot of energy by looking at IE5 motors. Uh, the next one is air conditioning. I spoke about air conditioning all. Uh, intelligent solutions and cooling systems, uh, there was variable primary before, then they came with the variable secondary and primary came together. Then we had uh, uh, two-way valves replacing three-way valves in the AHUs. But today you have these small pumps that you see in the picture replacing the valves in the AHUs so which eliminates the need for balancing valves and air conditioning, offers self-balancing the hydraulic uh, circuit, and also reduces the power consumption because then you can size your, your primary circuit or secondary circuit a little lower and allow these pumps to run at variable speed to actually give you the right kind of cooling. And this can be one per issue or one in a couple of issues, which then help you save a lot of power. We have seen, uh, and we're using these pumps easily a 30 35 percent uh, reduction in the power consumption in most areas in air conditioning systems so this is the end of my slides questions uh, the mindset the mindset is this technology is something that we need to sort out in our own minds we need to take questions like i said technology is not a replacement for a poor mindset or poor engineering when it comes to conservation it is only an enabler to help us to take the right decisions and ensure sustainable conservation. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, sir. Thanks for your address. Uh, I think your address covered right from a sectoral overview uh, to specifically taking the example of pumps and looking at uh, what can be done and uh, giving tips uh, for all the engineers here looking at right from selection to design to operation. And the survey that uh, you presented, sir, is quite uh, revealing, particularly look the efficiencies of pumps uh, at such large numbers across the uh, across the country. Uh, there are a lot of questions that I'll help you uh, read these questions and uh, you could uh, answer them. I've also tried to group the questions uh, so that we uh, we can answer them easily. Uh, sir, uh, there are, uh, first I'll take two questions that have come from the uh, chairman of Indian Green Building Council, Mr. V. Suresh. He has been a participant of the uh, webinar and he has asked two questions, sir. The first question is, uh, why is it that MEP engineers who are more involved in design and installation of these critical services not focus as much on energy efficiency? And why do we need uh, an energy audit study or an auditor to come later and uh, uh, identify these opportunities? That is the first question, sir. And the second question is, the ECBC still requires only 1% to 5% of renewables. Uh, do you think it is too small? And what can we do to raise the bar? Uh, sir, you are on mute, sir. Okay, yes. thing, uh, Suresh, uh, first thing that I must say is that uh, there is intent, but we are we execute very poorly. Uh, the first, I have to blame consumers like you and me. We do not want to pay initially. We are all focused on first cost. So when we go to an MEP uh, engineer, he has to quote the lowest. He has to ensure he saves you money. Uh, there is hardly any uh, chance given to them to prove 
how they can save you money throughout the life. And more or less, when you look at buildings, very few buildings where the promoter and the builder owns it, he builds it and hands it over to somebody else. So there is no uh, business case or business impetus on him to build something which will sort of save for the rest of his life. And that's where perhaps uh, uh, the buyers have to come in and form societies and say, and insist on builders and insist on and, and uh, on, on the uh, what you call consultants to ensure that they specify the right kind of building. But wherever promoter own buildings, I see that they do a fantastic job. And I also think that from the uh, IGBC, we should also push this concept of looking at the life cycle cost of an entire building uh, right up to the time it is sort of uh, things are disposed of. And that's important. And in terms of uh, 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 renewables, yes, I think we should. With the cost of renewables coming down, we should look at a slightly higher percentage of renewables uh, in, in the overall uh, energy consumption or energy buying that we do for any uh, large building or uh, factory or process. We should be able to do that. Uh, I, I would say that because today we are going, if we are looking at 30 or 40 percent of our energy to come from uh, renewables by 2030, we better start specifying this. Otherwise, there is no impetus. There's no. Uh, there's no push for us to get to that stage. Uh, thank you, sir. I think there are several questions on automation and control, and I'll try to group them and ask. There are two questions which are predominantly coming, sir. Where do you think India stands as far as uh, adopting automation and control in our operations are concerned? And uh, the second part of the question is, what are the things that you think we can do better? Yeah, uh, I wouldn't say that we are bad in terms of adopting automation and controls, but we are terrible in terms of maintaining them. I'll give you an example of, uh, uh, I'm not going to name names, of a building in Bangalore which had the best automation and controls in air conditioning. And they had uh, perhaps about 500 people in that one office in the building. And when we went for a cold check on that, we found that they were running the pump, the air conditioning pumps at a constant speed, and they didn't even know about it, that it has a variable speed system. When we looked at what had gone wrong, rats had chewed up the control wires, and there was no signal coming in, and that building ran for one year without, without with this kind of a thing, until we went and connected the wire, and in the next six months, they saved about 15 lakhs of rupees. Now, what do you say? What, it's a mindset problem. We need to, this chalta hai attitude does not work. We have good systems in India. I have no dearth of good systems. If you look at the market for controls, we have two. We have very large companies, uh, which are very expensive. And then we have very small niche companies, which then try to cut costs. What we need is, 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 is small companies and large companies to get together to have volumes which then brings down the cost for, for everybody to ensure that we have embedded electronics and everything. Uh, for example, some of you have asked this question, look, take your, take your uh, mobile phone, for instance, this one there. You know, there are about uh, between 20 to 40 sensors there, and you may pay about 25, 30,000 rupees for it, which means every sensor today is perhaps 200 to 500 rupees. But when you try a Braille sensor, uh, it probably costs you, a few, uh, you know, 10, 15,000 rupees. I don't see the reason why. So we need to look at uh, broad basing these and ensuring that we have products which are priced right for this country. Um, there are a lot of things that are not priced right for this country. We pay a lot more than others. Uh, but if you do that, uh, we certainly have all the brains. In fact, uh, most of the IoT and IT work across the world, you know, is, is done by Indians sitting here or sitting elsewhere. I think we have all the brains. We should we should start embedding all these into everything that we do. Uh, smart, what you call equipment, is something that is going to be a standard very soon. Uh, thank you, sir. Sir, there are a whole lot of questions on agricultural pumps, sir. The uh, the discussion goes around the cost of power, the efficiency of the pumps, solar pumps. And uh, what do you think can be done to improve uh, the efficiency in the agricultural pumping sector? So, as uh, long as you're giving farmer free power, free water, sir, this will never improve because everything has to have a business case. But that's a highly politically charged kind of situation. Uh, people in India, including you and me, think uh, that we have to get free water, which is our birthright. 
which is unfortunately not work. It at least should start paying, just like electricity. If you can afford to pay a little more, can pay a little more to subsidize those that cannot pay. But when you come to farmers, the government has been seized of this, which is why they had the EASL, uh, what you call it, ESCO basis of replacing inefficient pumps with efficient pumps. Believe it or not, the farmer doesn't want to pay too much because he may not have the money or he may have the money. It doesn't matter. There are two types of farmers. But let's say that he doesn't have the money to pay for an expensive pump. He buys the cheapest. And those pumps, when we tested, run at an average efficiency of 17 to 20%. Atrocious. And then he gets five horsepower free, but they have a 10 HP motor with a 5 HP labor. It's again atrocious. So because of that, he doesn't get power right through the day. He gets power for five, six hours, and sometimes at two o'clock in the morning. So he, he keeps his motor on so that it floods the field when he wants to try so much of water. So it's, 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 a, it's a kind of a negative spiral game that we are playing. We need to change that. And the government is sort of looking at it. They also started coming up with the Kusum scheme, and every state has come up with, uh, quite a few states have made it mandatory that farmers will be given only uh, a solar pump, and they have to pay only 10%, which means almost equal to what they would have paid for uh, their normal pump, and they would be given a solar pump, which is taken care of by the supplier for 10 years. Makes a huge difference. See what happens to solar. Solar is by far the best thing that we can do for both agriculture and for climate change. One. It gives water when it is required because you can you can have about between eight or nine a.m. to about four to five p.m. You can pump enough water, provide your water, and even store it. And then you have no impact on the environment. There is zero CO2 emissions. So it's 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 a wonderful thing. It's a little unaffordable at this point of time, but the government is doing all its best to subsidize it. But over a period of time, if we change our norms to make sure that motors and pumps and every other equipment we use have these as minimum efficiency norms like BE has done. BE has done a great job of what was five star, making it three star and increasing the, the norm a bit so that people now have to improve their efficiencies. Over a period of time, we will see it. But as long as we have something given free, nobody will actually respect uh, or will have the, what you call, push to go into something more efficient. When we pay, it hurts us, so we say. Uh, thank, you, sir. thank you. There are also several questions uh, asking for your views and opinion on what do you think are the uh, legal or the regulatory changes that are required if energy efficiency agenda has to be accelerated, if we want more impetus on the energy efficiency activities. Any thoughts on what you think are the changes required? First of all, we, we need a holistic approach on both the demand and supply side. Starting from the supply side, the lack of fuel or politics in the lack of fuel, right to the demand side of very, very, very inefficient equipment, uh, which is not from the unregulated sector or from uh, cheap imports. These are something that we need to regulate and say, this is the minimum standard. Uh, that is something. And then, then we have BIS, BEE, uh, ECBC, somebody else. Well, why are we having so many? Then we have our, we have, we have IGBC, we have we have, we have all of us talk about efficiencies. Why can't we all get together and have one norm which is universal? All of us sit together and say this is what is acceptable to India, and get the get the uh, buy-in from every state. Of course, the center has to buy in. Every state has to buy in, and make sure that we invite people. It cannot be a monopoly. It cannot be having one or two companies doing this and getting advantage. Invite manufacturers like we are inviting them for making in India and uh, get them into India to make these, both for India and for the rest of the world, I'm sure we will see very quick changes because households, when they start paying more and more for power, and power is going to be more expensive, they will suddenly realize that it's better to pay a little more and buy this equipment. And one of the most important things to me is to make sure that we have a plan, uh, like an ESCO, to fund these equipment so people are able to pay out of their savings. The moment you start paying out of your savings, then it makes total business sense for people to buy the most efficient equipment. And uh, they should also have the data for this. We should publish the data and let them take the choice between three star or four star or five star, like they're doing in air conditioning today. Thank you, sir. Uh, you touched upon Make in India. Sir, there are a few questions around that, uh, asking for your views on. What do you think is the preparedness level of uh, Indian manufacturers when we are looking at more demand for Make in India? And as a follow-up question to that, 
um, what do you think can be done to promote innovation in uh, india sir okay two things uh, our problem in making india's mindset uh first thing you know uh, i've often said this in many forums you give uh, your little child of 4 years old a toy with a kind of uh, uh, you know instruction sheet with the, he or she can see as a cartoon they will throw the instruction sheet first and they know how to operate that's exactly how the indians are have any of us read any instruction sheet given to us there are exceptions any of us do no we do not follow processes for consistency in quality we, we do have great quality in areas but for consistency in quality we need to follow processes in every everybody can't be a thinker we come to an agreement and we say okay fine this is what we will follow till we have a consensus to make the change so if you see what happens i again give this example for you many years i have been doing if you tell every pilot a pilot who has got 20000 years of uh, i mean hours of flying can he throw away his checklist it's like that you have to have a checklist you have to revisit what we are doing we have to see that we don't go off the process we got to be very very careful that we follow processes and this i've seen in china and that's where they are that's the reason why they are able to replicate mass produce compared to indians where we think ah maybe we find a better way of doing it that's one part the second part of it are input costs are very high compared to the rest of the world input costs whether pre production or even material and that is also due to the inefficiencies we have in the system so we need to tweak inefficiencies all across when i say inefficiencies inefficiencies in the garment processes inefficiencies in the way we have uh, uh, policies and the way we actually implement policies and inefficiencies in the way the private sector and the public sector operate in its in its, in its uh, what you call factories or offices very important that we, we bring in there are pockets of excellence brilliant uh, companies in india who are doing a great job now can we replicate them can we all join all these people uh, all these dots and come together so, uh, you see over the last 5 or 10 years or or 15 years there's been a great improvement in india compared to what we were in many areas take take the local restaurant which serving you uh, uh, what you call uh, street food in a small place the way they have done it up i'm very surprised earlier it used to be a dump yard you wouldn't even walk there now you can actually go there and have a, a cup of tea or something so a lot of lot of improvements have taken place but we have a long way to go still so it's it's a, it's a holistic approach so if all of us take what we are uh, focused on and uh, make an agreement that we will do our best to come together i think uh, it doesn't take too many years to change uh, i was uh, last year uh, in portugal to, uh, to look at their water system uh, 10 years ago their water was the most polluted people were not paying for it today their water is the cleanest you can drink it off the tap people pay for the water and all the municipal water uh, uh, facilities both wastewater and clean water are profit making and they are owned by the local municipality and uh, uh, and, and like a corporate if if portugal can do it in 10 years i am sure uh, the size of portugal may be uh, a number of states we can do state by state let's start there if you have to start uh, if you can't do all of india so the southern states are really uh, well placed for this we should take it on and there are some states up in the north of course there are social issues in some of the northern states where we are but let them deal with it one by one uh thank you sir you touched upon the uh, discussion on uh, energy service companies or escos uh, there are a couple of questions related to how pumping uh, system efficiency could be facilitated through esco kind of projects and a more bigger question than that uh, which was also asked is how can we make financing available efficiency implementation in the country sir either through esco or uh, directly uh, to the uh, end users yeah this is one area which has been very slow and uh, being uh, rolled out in india we've been talking of escos for the last 30 years but the impact has been very poor mainly because of the financing aspect of uh, the escos uh, people when they first came in they were looking at very very big tickets there was no small money available to sort of do smaller projects But now I find a lot of boutique uh, uh, sort of uh, companies growing, uh, coming up, which are able to handle these smaller projects. We are even able to sort of uh, put in all the equipment themselves, or come together as a consortium, put in the equipment themselves, and then ensure that uh, the the user pays 
for what they use or based, based on the savings that they see. And, and uh, I'm very sure that this will sort of uh, catch on very soon because uh, money is a tough commodity to come by. And more and more people are thinking, why should I own something that I only have to run as a process and I'm not the expert. I should focus on what product I'm making or service I'm giving and let the experts do what they have to do. So this is one thing. The issue uh, uh, with financing has been there uh, because uh, there's a huge element of risk in ESCOs to ensure that there's a longevity of the companies. Suppose you have a, a six, five, six or 10 year contract. Will the user company pay the ESCO company for all these things? What are the, what is the kind of uh, uh, risk mitigation that one has? These are areas that we need to do. Perhaps we should have, uh, you know, insurance companies trying to insure these, which will make it much better, uh, uh, you know, and much more acceptable to many of the escrow companies to do take a little more risk. Uh, they can sort of, we should have financing companies set up for this reason, where they can take the risk to sort of finance based on the the, the balance sheet and the PNL of the user companies. Like they are, uh, like banks are giving them money, they should be able to give money for this because this is a no-brainer because they're going to have a very clear idea of their uh, their uh, what you call uh, payback periods, and uh, they know that how much is the savings per year. Um, the other thing that I've seen in the ESCO business when we have looked at in the pump industry, when we uh, offered ESCO, the savings were so good that the end user said, no, 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 why should you make the money? I will make the money, and said, okay, I will pay. Uh, and, and buy the equipment. So, you know, sometimes if it is too good, then it should take the call to buy the equipment. The other thing that I see uh, when, when when you say that let's replace equipment, um, the process that we have for capital goods, if you want to buy, is a kind of long process. The utility engineer will, will say we will actually want it, then he will make up uh, what you call study, he will send it to the big bosses, the, the, the board will then approve the budget, then it comes down again, then it comes to the finance man who will pay it, then it comes to the purchaser who will try to bargain, uh, not knowing that uh, this, the, the better the equipment, the more the savings. So ultimately the whole thing uh, gets obfuscated in this process. So if you look at uh, the ESCO process where they don't have to put in any money except a, a legal contract, then perhaps it's going to be a little easier for the legal people, the finance people, and the bosses to say, okay, this is our outlay. We have a very clear picture of what our uh, liabilities are. We will agree upon six or seven years. We will de-risk the escrow company by doing this, 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 and let's go ahead and, and, and use it. And I, I don't see this model will pick up, although it's been slow. I cannot hazard a guess because of prior uh, experience of how soon it will pick up, but actually it is moving faster than it was in the past. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, there are a couple of questions on water supply and management as a service. And uh, one part of the question was if uh, water is a subject which is managed by uh, the government, what can we do in terms of accelerating implementation or investments uh, as far as efficiency is concerned? And second is uh, with the discussion on smart cities and uh, several townships coming in, do you see a future for water supply and uh, water management? Uh, to be a service model? I mean, are there uh, uh, any players who could be interested? Is there a role for private sector to come in? Would water supply or management become a service sooner than later? Uh, I would say later than sooner it will be. <laughs> Basically, the reason being that uh, uh, it's still a very uh, politically charged kind of thing. Uh, my personal view is that uh, the assets have to be owned by the government and the operation and maintenance have to be handed over to private companies. Uh, very much like uh, what has been done with electricity, where uh, generation can be with the government, there could be private companies distributing it and ensuring that they collect it. One, the first thing that we need to do is to put meters on water consumption. Whether you charge or not, is important to measure. When you don't measure, you can't be efficient, whether it's water or electricity. It's important to know how much we consume, where we consume, how much is being wasted, how much is being efficiently used. So once we have that, then we can actually start looking at how we use water. So definitely this is going to come because uh, at one point of time, if you run out of water, there's no other way but manage it properly to ensure that we uh, give access to everybody. So if not, 
now sooner it will be later when our back is against the wall but i do sincerely hope that we are more proactive and this comes a little faster there are already a few states and a few companies the few cities that have tried it out uh, there has been a lot of learning some negative some positive so i i presume that we will come to some kind of a conclusion especially when we are looking at smart cities because uh, to me a smart city is not a wired city a smart city is a city where uh, it's sustainable financially uh, very clearly uh, whether it's profit people or planet everybody gains out of that and we are able to sort of uh, uh, have the lowest impact on the environment so that's what a smart city is all about so i'm sure water water management would be a part of it the moment you start measuring and giving out water uh, we will be able to then say what needs to be done to save water the other issue i see with water um, there is a lot of nexus between water and electricity uh, the more water you pump the more electricity you, you, you actually uh, consume the more water you waste the more electricity you consume uh, water again is a very uh, strange issue uh, the government in the center only has uh, uh, is not really responsible for the states are responsible the government has many ministries both at the center and uh, at the states uh, now there is a jal shakti ministry with four of those ministries together but there have been some 13 to 17 ministries handling water how can you have somebody responsible for your drinking water somebody else responsible for your waste water somebody responsible for agriculture water and somebody else responsible for your uh, industry water the water is the same so we need to have a very holistic approach uh, one owner of water if it's a river it's a river basin owner if it's a water basin so water basin owner one owner if it's a uh, city one owner and you can have local people managing it whether private or public and you can actually have local people, local um, and private sector managing it so that like they're doing now with uh, solar water pumps where they're giving 10 years uh, of o and m2 these companies can be asked to sort of uh, uh, operate and maintain these and paid for it or some kind of a financial structure could be done and i'm sure this will work very well and everybody will get 24 by 7 access to water and clean drinking water yes it might hit the, the bottle drinking water industry badly but then people are paying so much for bottle drinking water you probably you will be able to get water at one tenth the price that you're paying today for the, for the bottles i'm not against bottle drinking water sometimes we have to use it but then there is a whole lot of people uh, the few hundred million that we spoke about who have no access to clean drinking water and i think we should start with that thank you sir uh, so there are a lot of questions on uh, the industrial scenario post covid once the lockdown opens and once we have uh, the manufacturing activities picking up uh, there are several questions in terms of what you foresee as the industry demand uh, energy efficiency do you, do you think it would take a back seat or would industry still uh, put their focus on energy efficiency to improve competitiveness and as advocates of energy efficiency what can we do at this time to accelerate investments and activities on energy efficiency i actually said that in the first few opening sentences uh, there is not going to many many greenfield or brownfield projects people are going to focus on reduction of input costs and energy is something energy and water is something that is vital so there will be many people who are focusing on efficiencies and trying to bring down the input costs and if you have a solution which then gives them a, a very reasonable payback period they will definitely go in for this and most companies will now focus on being more efficient uh, uh, i i shared a, a cartoon which was sent to me which said uh, who had the greatest impact in digitalization in 2020 this is the ceo cto or covid and everybody had marked covid so covid has done a good job in in, in pushing digitalization and which digitalization comes measurement and and and, uh, and uh, logging data logging and that improves our decision making and all of us i think the whole all sectors will move towards better efficiency and i think there is a tremendous amount of potential now uh, it will take a little bit of time because people may be out of little, uh, out of money. But if we are able to get in with a consortium of funders of of, uh, of what you call technologies and implementers, uh, I don't think there's anything that is going to stop you from doing very very well. Thanks a lot, sir. I think we've uh, addressed most of the questions, but there is just one request uh, that I had to make. 
uh, sir, when we looked at the registrations for this uh, session today, we had over uh, 650 people registered for this session. And uh, nearly about 30% of them were young engineers, people who are just looking at uh, their careers into energy efficiency, early stages of uh, uh, their careers in manufacturing or uh, uh, in consulting. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to know if you have any words uh, for them uh, who are looking at energy efficiency in their career, sir. Any words of, uh, uh, any words of suggestions from your side? So first of all, as engineers, learn to get your hands dirty. When I say that, doesn't mean go put it in muck. Work with your hands. Basic principles of engineering are very, very vital. Don't substitute apps or software for what you can think of basic practice or what you call principles of first uh, first principles of practice. Important that you know the theory behind what you're doing. At least understand the theory. You don't have to be an expert. Once you have, once you know the the, the theory behind the basic working knowledge behind what what we call common sense engineering, uh, then you will understand that what you need to do and look at things holistically. Please do not look at, you know, look at a pump. Don't think you can improve efficiency by just looking at a pump. You need to look at the entire system because systems interact with each other. Look at people who are operating. Let me give you a simple example. You have the best of IoT systems, you have the best of pumps, variable speed, everything is fantastic very low consumption what you call fittings in your bathrooms and toilets and your spray systems and somebody is going to keep his tap open or his valve leaks what can you do you are going to be inefficient you know one drop of water leaking from a tap means twenty-four thousand liters of water per year have these little thumb rules just look at these simple things and look for your system and then you will see how quickly you can change things to change people's mindset. Then today you have technology in our engineering days 50 years ago, 45 years ago, there was not that much technology. We had just seen the advent of a programmable calculator or scientific calculator, not even program. Today you have everything at your fingertips. Use that technology to make quick decisions, online decision making, uh, which will then help everybody. But if you're going to just sort of, you know, base yourself on apps and not know the basic theory of working knowledge, I don't think you'll get too far because there'll always be somebody uh, who's like an old grandfather who has got this wealth of experience who will send shoot down your argument even without all the tools that you have. So it's important that you do both. Uh, and all the knowledge today is available at the click of a button. Read through what, what you need to read through. You don't have to be an expert in anything. Whatever you like, what is your passion, look through that. And become very good at it, both on the basic principle side, the theory side, and the practical side, and the technology side. Thanks a lot, sir. Uh, that was uh, very helpful. And we're getting a lot of uh, messages uh, thanking you for those words of wisdom. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, this stage, sir, I can just thank you for uh, uh, agreeing to participate in this uh, lecture series today sharing your thoughts on what we think uh, can be done for efficiency, speaking specifically about uh, the pumping system, which cuts across, I guess, all the industries, all the industrial sectors where we have participants from uh, today. And I think uh, with your experience, sir, you have touched upon all the areas, uh, technical, policy, financing, uh, automation, innovation. Uh, I can just uh, thank you for your time and for your address here today, sir. Thanks a lot. Thanks for joining us today. It was a pleasure. Unfortunately, I couldn't see any of you but it was a pleasure. I only wish it was a little more interactive because uh, I learn a lot from people whom I listen to and you can learn from anybody. You know, that's important. Keep your ears and eyes open and you keep learning at every, every, every point of your time. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, CIGBC. Thanks a lot, Giri. And thanks a lot to all the people who are on uh, this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.